So we got some rain today. We were praying for rain. Amazing. You know, some of you guys, I know I've had a lot of people come up to me since I've been here, and you guys have been telling me that you're isolated, you're all alone where you came from, and it's hard, and so you're trying to find people to network with. Now's the time to do that. Uh, find people who are close to you. You know, there's fellowships here, there's fellowships all over Cape Town, there's fellowships out where you live. I mean, you can grow your own fellowship out where you live. Just a few people who come together on Shabbat and read the scriptures. You know, that's something that you need. So if you can, network with people who may be close to you here. And then keep your ears open for future events that are going to happen, you know, uh, conferences and meetings, and travel and attend some of those so that you can network with other believers and create the, this network between the people here. It makes sense? Okay, because you guys need that. You know, it's, it can be depressing when, you're, when you think you're all alone. And so I don't want you to be depressed. I want you to be hopeful and excited. Because this is exciting times we live in. Um, yesterday we prayed for rain, and the Father showed his people favor. You know, let this be a sign to you that the Father has not forgotten his people. Okay? So, you know, everyone looks at an American homestead, and they're like, oh, your place is so beautiful, and you have a beautiful farm, and you have a beautiful family there, and you have this, you've done so much work, and you've made these buildings, and the land looks so good, and Folks, that's not my home. My home is where he placed his people. It's in Israel. And one day we're going to go back there. So allow this rain to be a sign unto you guys to let you know he hasn't forgotten his people. That one day he's going to bring us all out of here, out of our, out of our homes, out of our lands we're at, out of the places where we've been scattered. And he's going to bring us back to our true home. And we're going to start over just like they did. And we're going to build homes. And this time we're going to be obedient to his commandments. But then let this be a sign that he hasn't forgotten you. You know, we prayed for rain yesterday. And more rain's coming. He's going to show favor and grace upon his people because he knows his people are here. We've cried out to him now. We've called unto his name. And he's responding. Okay? So um, we're going to have some great stuff. Let's just go ahead and start off with a word of prayer. And we're going to get into it. Abba, Father, we just thank you for this rain, beautiful rain that makes your land grow that you have us here on. And so, Father, uh, your people are gathered, and they, they cry out to you, and they're, they're seeking your favor, and they, they want you to know that they want to be obedient to your commands. And, and that, So don't forget us. Bring us home. You've made a promise to us. We don't know the timing of it. We don't know, you know the, 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 the logistics of it. We just know what's going to happen. When you make a promise to your people, you keep it. So we're ready, we're prepared, we're crying out to you, and we're seeking your face. Show us favor, continue to show us favor, and give us the hand we need to lead us out into home. We want to come home. So Father, as we, as we continue through the conference, there's so many great messages that have to be brought still. Give us hope, give us excitement, and give us a joy that we know that you're looking after your people. Father, we pray all this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay. Let's see what we got here. The Greater Exodus Part 2, 144,000. And um, let me get my... Hold on. Get a little quicker. I don't know if I'll put it back in my bag or not. That's all right. I don't need it. It's okay. Okay, the 144,000. Again, I'm not a teacher. I'm a student. I'm just learning like all you guys, okay? You know, I'm, I, I don't like it when people call me teacher. I know some people do, and that's fine. And I know by standing up here, it almost makes me one of those. And it, holds, it does hold me to a higher standard. I know I'm going to be judged on the things I say, and so I need to be careful. I need to have a fear of my God when I do it. But at the same time, I want you to think of me as a student. I'm just learning like all you guys. And I'm wrong about things. I'm right about things. But I'm trying my best, okay, just like you are. We're all new to Torah. No one's ever going to be old to Torah, okay? We're just all learning. And especially on topics like these, when it comes to prophecy, and there's so many people who have opinions on a topic like this, I really reserve the right to be wrong about everything you're about to see, okay? 
It's just my opinion. It's based on what I see in the scriptures. I'm sharing it with you, and you guys chew on it. You guys can be the judge and let me know what you think. Okay? Maybe, you, in fact, a lot of these times when I do these, these, um, these talks, people come to me with new information that I hadn't seen before. And so I really rely on you guys for a lot of the information I put into these things. Because I come to places like this, and you guys give me great information. I take it back home, I study it, and then boom. It's a, it's a new topic of, of conversation on my channel, okay? So who are the 144,000? Folks, this is like one of the most debated topics in all of churchianity. All the churches have an opinion on it. And so my opinion is what I call my horse in the race, okay? So who's heard of the Kentucky Derby, right? Do they have horse races here? Yeah. They do? Is it like a really... <laughs> is it is it really popular? Yeah. Is everybody lacquer? <laughs> he told me to say that. I don't know what that means. Um, but yeah, uh, horse races, they're really popular in the U.S. Um, during certain times of the year. And uh, the Kentucky Derby is obviously one of the big ones. At Churchill Downs. That's what you see there. It's a picture of the horses coming out of the gate. And you go and you place your bets, and you say, I want this horse to win, or I think this horse is going to win. Well, when it comes to 144,000, I have a horse. When it comes to prophecy and looking at prophecy, I pick a horse based on my studies, and I reserve the right to change horses in the middle of the race. You can't do that at Kentucky Derby. But I can do it. Okay, It's my horse. I can choose another horse if I want to. And I'm going to usually pick a horse and if I pick a horse, sometimes I'll just wait and see how the race ends. That's all we can do is just watch the race and see how it ends. And if my horse falls dead on the racetrack, I'll pick a new horse. But I'm just doing my best at guessing a horse to see what the father's going to do. Okay? Hindsight of prophecy is always 2020. You don't know it until it happens. This has been a topic of much debate especially in the Christian churches in America. I don't know about here, but everyone talks about the 144,000. <clears> every, every denomination has their own opinion on who that is, and it usually includes them. Okay? <laughs> okay. Let's be honest here. If there were only 144,000 saved from the earth, that's going to be a really small exodus. We've already seen the verses that talk about a greater exodus, one that's so big that they don't even talk about the old one anymore. You know, the Lord lives that brought up the people out of the land of Egypt. No, it's the Lord lives that brought up the people out of the north and all the countries where he scattered and even the islands of the sea, right? Have you ever noticed that anyone who tries to explain the 144,000 always includes themselves in that number? All the videos you watch online, all the teachers. Oh, yeah, here's the 144,000. And oh, by the way, I'm one of them. That's what they say, right? <laughs> How arrogant. At this point, I have not heard of any other ministries or denominations. This is the point I was writing this about a year ago. Many of you probably have, have heard it by now. With the theory that I'm going to share with you today, okay, that may mean I'm completely wrong on all this because I'm the only one sharing this theory. You know, there's a few others now who have clung on to it and, and thought that it might be good. So I'm the, you know, at this point, if I'm the only one talking about it, maybe I'm completely off base here. I wouldn't be wasting your time or my time if I thought I was wrong. Okay? Simple fact. I wouldn't have taken the time to write this out or to study it out and to bring it to you if I thought I was wrong. So I think I'm right. So I'm going to share with it with you, and then you guys can decide. I believe Scripture backs me up and that God often works in ways we don't expect. How often does that happen? A lot. You know, we expect God to do one thing, and He does something else. Our Creator works in cycles. It's just His pattern. You see it all throughout your Bible. My theory has precedent. Okay, You can look back in Scripture and see this, what I'm about to tell you, over and over, actually. I will show examples of my theory in Scripture. So let's get started. God chooses two, two types of people for His special purposes. When you look in your Bible and you read your Scriptures, every single time it's two separate people. Two distinct types of people. Amazing. Two types of people. Number one, people who don't want to be chosen. They refuse to be chosen. Jonah. Jonah was not happy. 
It's like, what? You want me to go to Nineveh? I'm not going to Nineveh. No, no. Send someone else. I'm not going there. God says, nope, you're going there. He makes, he enforces his, his choice on Jonah. Jonah, you're going. Moses, Moses did not want to go. In fact, so much so that God got angry at him. He said, I don't want to do it. I'm not the person for this job. God's like, stop it. You are. Deal with it. And then people who are the most unlikely to be chosen. Samuel. So you have people who don't want the job, and then people who are the most unlikely of candidates. Anybody here a manager at a job? Anybody here who hires people? Okay, a few of you. Good. Right. Sometimes you look at resumes that come across your desk, and you're like, this guy is not qualified at all. <laughs> And, 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 you know, sometimes you might, you might, you may hire somebody who is not qualified at all, and that person surprises you. You know, he, or he works out really well, or he or she works out really well. People who are chosen are, are the most unlikely to be chosen sometimes. Those, those are the two types, people who don't want the job and people who are, are the most unlikely of candidates for that job. Examples are Samuel and David. You know, Samuel was this little boy in the temple, and Eli, the priest, was like, What? You, you know, you, next time he, you know, he couldn't believe it, you know, but next time he calls you out, answer him. You know, and he bypassed the high priest for a little boy in the temple. David, David, his parents left him out in the field. He's like, obviously, surely one of these sons you're going to choose to be the king. You're going to anoint. Oh, I do have one other. He's out in the field, though, but you don't want him. You got these guys right here, big, strapping, handsome young men. And he didn't want those. He wanted the little shepherd boy out in the field that no one ever even gave a thought about. The most unlikely of candidates. It wasn't Jesse's firstborn for sure. It's group number two that I think we're dealing with here with 144,000. The most unlikely of candidates. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and just give you my reasons. Let's turn to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, you can turn there in your Bible. We'll read some verses. Revelation 14, we're going to start off at verse 4. A number of years ago, my wife was reading her Bible, and she read this verse. We were sitting in our living room and um, going through this, and uh, she made an observation. Verse 4, verse four of chapter 14 of Revelation, it says, these are, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever, wheresoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, there's all kinds of people who will tell you that not being defiled with women, it's the woman of Babylon. It has nothing to do with, you know, mating and, you know, marriage or anything like that. No, no, no. It's just about being defiled with the, with the woman that is the world of Babylon. Okay? It's the beast system. We're not defiled by her. It's those people. No. Or it's when we get saved. When we get saved, we're now a new creation. We're the bride. We're the woman. And we can... No. What does it say? These are they which were not defiled with women, for they were virgins. First fruits. We're going to go through the scripture. We're going to break it down. And she says, why can't these just be children? All kinds of theories. But why can't they just actually be kids? Not old enough to have been with a wife, a male child, not old enough to have, to have been with a wife, and they're first fruits, firstborns. 144,000 are kids. That's my belief. Now, for the rest of the time, I'm just going to share with you the evidence that I have, the scriptural evidence, and you're going to decide whether or not it's true. Okay? You can decide whether or not this has any weight, it has any merit, and then go on you know, with how you will. But I'm going to give you the evidence. That's, I'm just, this point forward, I'm just making the case for my theory. Revelation chapter 7. <clears throat> and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor in the sea, nor in any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. 
And there were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then it goes on the list of 12,000 out of each of the tribes. You're, you're familiar with this, right? We've read it lots and lots. And then Revelation 7, verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, and stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palms in their hands. Palms in their hands. Sounds like Sukkot. There's a feast here. In Leviticus 23, 40, you compare it with this verse. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So what I see here going on in Revelation 7 is the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, it's a celebration. A lot of people in Christianity, where I come from, will tell you that Revelation 7 verse is the martyrs, the people who have died in the tribulation, and now they're standing before the throne. I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. Now that I have an eye for Torah... I see it for what it is. I believe it's a Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? <clears throat> so you have Revelation 14, Revelation 7. The rest of Revelation 7 is about those who came out of the tribulation, the greater exodus. That's what, the, that's what Revelation 7 is about. The last verse in Revelation 7, very interesting, compared on your own time. But Revelation 7, the last verse, is quoting Isaiah 25, verse 8, the wiping away of the tears. Because at the end, there's a judgment that takes place. You know, and it's giving a brief overview in Revelation 7 of that judgment that's coming that gets described further in Revelation. Okay? And so the tears, they get wiped away. <clears throat> Revelation 14. 14.1, 14, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount of Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Interesting verse. Father's name written in their foreheads. Remember that. That's very important. We're going to come back to it. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung it as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever He goes. These were the redeemed from among men, being the first fruits, very important, unto God and to the Lamb. Next verse. And in their mouth was found no guile. Does anybody know what guile means? What does guile mean? In English. It's deceit. Deceit. There is no deceit in their mouths, for they are without fault before the throne of God. You see, I don't think there's a person in this room, just letting you know, there's not a person in this room that's not without fault before the throne of God. Okay? We've all sinned. We're all unclean. Okay? We've all done things. Our, even our, the best deeds we do, we do are like filthy rags. Only our Messiah stands in the place for us to have access to Him. Okay? That's our goodness. That's where it comes from. But see, these people... They're without fault. They're without guile. They're first fruits. Let's keep looking at the evidence. So this is all, this is all we know about the 144,000 as mentioned in Revelation 7 and 14. So let's now begin to break down these verses and explore a few things. Let's take a look at Revelation 14.4 and break this up into what we see as spiritual defilement, where it says, these are they which were not defiled with women. So defilement, basically all kinds of excuses and interpretations are made to be sure to include the interpreter. So, you know, you know, I, I've, I've been saved and I've, you know, repented of my sins. And so I'm not defiled anymore. Why not just take the verse at face value instead of trying to read in a meaning that's not there? It's pride. I want to be in that number. Oh, how I want to be in that number. I want to be part of that. Defiled in verse 4 can simply mean stained or polluted, being in a state of uncleanness. Just like there is value in a red heifer that has been without yoke, remember, in Numbers 19.2, a red heifer that's never been used for work. It's just been there. It's a young red heifer. It's never had that yoke placed upon its back. There is value in a male child that has never been yet, has not been yet made unclean with a woman. Is it a sin to be unclean? No. But it's a sin to be unclean and go before the Father. You don't come to Him in that state. You wash first. You wash and be unclean until even. 
Well, just like there's value in that red heifer that's never had a yoke placed upon its back, who's never been in that unclean state ever before in its life, there's value on a male child that has also maintained the cleanness of his birth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. These were the redeemed among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. What in Torah do we see redeemed as first fruits among men? Mm -hmm. Children. That's what Revelation says. It says, being the first fruits redeemed. That's only male children in Torah. Male children in Torah. And it shall be when thy son asks thee in time to come, saying, What is this? That thou, is, that thou shalt say unto him, By strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of bondage. Verse 15, And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that opens the matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. These are kids. I'm talking about kids. Children are a fruit of the womb, are they not? Blessed is your fruit of the womb. The first fruits of the womb can be redeemed by God. Verses Exodus 13, 15, Exodus 34, 19, Numbers 3, 12, and Numbers 18, 15 back that up. Children can be redeemed by God. In the temple, you would bring a, a, a temple payment to redeem your child. Or you could even give your child to the temple. You know, it, it, was, it, was a, it was an honor to, be, to sacrifice your child for that way, to give him to service to the Most High. And so those verses back that up. You could, you could do that. Check out this next verse. Revelation 14, 5. And there was, in their mouth there was found no guile. Remember, deceit. Deceit. And I asked, uh, when I was over at Tian's house this morning, I asked some people if they knew what this next show was. I don't know how far back on you could get our American TV. But does anybody know what show that is or who that is? Anybody recognize this show? In English. <laughs> Not Webster, no. Yes, what? Yes, kids say the darndest things. In America, this was one of the most popular shows from like the late 1940s to the 1960s. Midway through, it was taken over by Bill Cosby. The man you see on the screen there is a guy named Art Linkletter. And he was very popular. This was a very, very popular show. It ran for like almost two decades in America. And it's kids say the darndest things. You want to know why kids say the darndest things? Because they're honest. When you add, they purposely put these kids on the stage and they ask them basically very harmless questions, but questions that would usually give a pretty embarrassing response to the parents or to the audience. It was amazing. It was a very funny show, and you can find it on YouTube today. You can still watch the episodes, you know, for free. It was an amazing show, and it's because what made it so amazing is, these, is because these kids simply told the truth. They didn't know any better. They were just honest. They were giving an honest answer based on what they saw in the world around them. And it was very popular. It was very funny. Kids say the darndest things. You want to know why? It's because they have no guile. They have no deceit. They haven't grown up yet to understand politics and worldly views. You know, they're not, they're not trying to deceive anyone with their answer based on their worldview, whether it be of God or something else. Okay? They're just honest. They're, they're telling you what they see. Amazing. And in their mouth was found no guile. That's, my, that's one of my top evidences that this is kids we're talking about here. Because every adult begins to be raised with a point of view, a worldly point of view, based on their politics, based on their parents' upbringing, based on their religious views. Guile and deceit enter into their mouths, whether you know it or not. You, know, you have an opinion that has guile in it. God chooses children. There's precedent for this. I told you that. There's precedent. We have Samuel. We have David. We have Daniel. We have Josiah. God uses kids oftentimes. And oftentimes it's at you know, the surprise of all the adults you know, who are surrounding them. Samuel stayed with Hannah until, she, until he was weaned and then was brought to Eli the priest. 
So that's a small boy. He was a small boy when he came to the priest. God did not speak with Eli, the high priest, but to the small child Samuel. He passed up the high priest, the one that all the nation would think would be first for God to go to. And he passed him up for a kid who was in the temple. As an adult, that might make you mad. You know, because here I am, qualified by lineage and training, and I got passed up for a small child. I don't think Eli did that, but for a lot of people it would. Keep that in mind. We'll go down that road later. We don't know how old he was when the father started speaking to him. We just know he was a small boy. We figure he was a small boy. David wasn't even called to the sacrifice when the rest of the family was called. He wasn't important enough. He was a small child. You know, I remember my grandfather telling me stories of when he was a child, um, that when guests would come over and they would have parties, it was the adults that would sit around the table and they would eat first. And it was just tradition that the kids would eat last. Whatever was, whatever was left on the table, that's what the kids ate. They ate last. I mean, kids were not looked, you know, it's different today. It's all about the children today. We've got to do the children, the children. But back then, it was like, you know, adults eat first and then the kids eat last. You have respect for your elders. You know, one day you'll be there. But they didn't even think to call him in. The fact, that David, the fact that David watched the sheep shows that probably Jesse had no servants and was probably not a very rich family. Otherwise, he'd just have his servants out there, you know? But he had boys. You see, richness comes from your children. You know, it's those arrows in your quiver. I look at my two boys and I'm like, man, this is great. I've got, a, I've got two good arrows in my quiver. <clears throat> Josephus states that David was age 10 at this time. We don't know that for sure, but that's what Josephus says. Daniel. Daniel is described as the Hebrew word yelled, which absolutely means children. There's no other way to go around that. It's not used very often in your Torah for children. Most of the times you see children, it's a different Hebrew word. But for this one, it's the Hebrew word yelled. Absolutely, it means child okay, or children. He was smart and skilled in knowledge. Daniel verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 says this. And these four boys had skill and learning and wisdom, but only Daniel, it says, had the ability to interpret visions and dreams. He was a smart kid. Josiah became king at age eight, eight years old. Can you imagine being king of an entire nation at age eight? Imagine the adult influence that would be, that would be trying to manipulate that eight-year-old all the time. It's amazing he turned out the way he did. He did right in the sight of God. He sought after the high priest for knowledge of Torah. That didn't happen even amongst the adults a lot of times in the kings of Israel was only one of two kings in the history of Israel that destroyed the high places and idols in the land. One of only two. He was a special kid. He had an amazing, someone had an amazing influence on him when it came to Torah in his young life. So let's talk about pride a little bit. Now we've talked about kids, especially some kids who are in power. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Mark 7, 21, 22. Let's go to Proverbs 8, 13. All kinds of verses in Proverbs about hate and pride. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. The Father hates pride. What better way, what better way, <laughs> there's no better way, what better way for God to stick it to a bunch of prideful, boasting teachers, scholars, pastors, and pointy-headed theologians than to pass all of them up for a bunch of kids to lead God's people into the promised land? You see, the first time he had Moses. He chose Moses, someone who didn't want the job. Remember our first category, you know, who wasn't well-spoken, also an unlikely candidate, because no one would use someone who had a speech impediment. He fit the bill perfectly. He used him, but is, how's he going to find 144,000 Moseses to lead God's people? Because remember, we're talking about a greater exodus here. We're not talking about an exodus that's going to be only 144,000 people. No, I believe these 144,000 people are going to lead the body out. So a greater exodus, they, they estimate the first exodus was between 3 and 5 million people. You know, the different theologians and scholars disagree. We don't know. But they estimate three to five million people. Have you ever seen three to five million people in one spot? Oh, you've never seen that. I've never. I, I can't imagine. 
I think I even looked online. I think the biggest crowd ever taken a picture of was like 700,000. It was huge. So three to five million people. How are you going to find leaders for all that? 144,000 seems about right. And so what a better way to stick it to all these people who are full of pride and knowledge to pick a little child and put a song into their mouth that they can lead the people all of one heart. And they shall come from the east and from the west. This is Luke 13, 29, amazing verse. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. An obvious mention of the greater exodus. Because what comes from the east, so, I mean, it's we. We're coming from the, in all four corners of the earth. North, east, south, and west. We're coming from all, everywhere, even the islands of the sea, to the kingdom of God, the kingdom in Jerusalem, and who will be our king, our Messiah. Next verse, amazing. So first verse is the greater exodus coming from north, east, south, and west, and then this. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, let's go over. Remember when the disciples were disputing amongst themselves about who would be the greatest? Right? Check this out. Mark 9, 35. And he sat down and he called the twelve. And he said unto them, If any man desires to be the first, the same shall be the last of all and servant of all. Now, we just read in Luke, last, first, first, last. And he equated that with the greater exodus, north, south, east, west. All these people were coming to be in the kingdom all over the planet, right? And then... We have 935 where he says, he sat down, and these people are arguing who's going to be in charge. He says, <laughs> who's going to be in charge? <laughs> the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Again, first, last, last, first, right? Next verse. Do you want to guess what's in the next verse? He took a child, and he set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, whosoever shall receive one such children in my name, one of such like these, in my name receives me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Amazing. Who shall receive one such as these in my name? Remember Revelation 14, 1, And lo, I looked, and a lamb stood on the mountain of Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. I mean, come on. I mean, it's just some critical thinking skills, basic, right? Some people are not going to be very happy being passed over for leadership by a child. They're just not. If you can receive the leadership of a child, you are truly humble and ready to receive our Father. I mean, can you do that? Would you be able to go into work one day if you are an elder statesman in your job, having spent the last 20 years working there, and they put a guy who was 19 as your new boss who had never worked there a day in his life? You'd be pretty angry. What do you know? You've just got here. I've been doing this for 20 years. That's pride. That's pride. Let's keep going. We haven't gotten started yet. Mark 10, 13. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Yeshua saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Next verse. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. So let's just ponder this for a second. So we get to the camps of the greater exodus. There's a giant pillar of fire there. And everyone arrives. You arrive and you got your backpack on and maybe a cart or something. Or maybe you drive up in your Toyota. And you're like, oh. This is great. You know, this is amazing. You know, who's in charge here? What, what are we doing? What's, what's next? And, and uh, yeah, that little kid over there, he's in charge. What? Wait a minute. I thought my pastor's here. You know, you know this, my teacher's here. My son, whatever. You know, he, what? And don't challenge that kid. I don't want to tell you what happened to the last guy that challenged that kid. Because he's not here anymore. <laughs> Can you see that happening? I could totally see that happening. Next verse. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. To me, man, it's just so, 
it's so obvious. Our Father works in ways that we don't expect. And I'm not saying, you know, this is it. I'm not saying this is just my horse in the race, right? But to me, the, the evidence is overwhelming. So I believe the 144,000 are children, actual kids. But there's more. So I think some of the best possible evidence of the 144,000 being children is something that you won't find in Scripture. You know, one of the things, everyone's like, you know, oh, I don't want to go into that. I better not say that. One of the best ways you can find what God loves is seeing what the enemy hates. Right. So with that in mind, let's continue. Who's in charge here? Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. I want to show you, who. I mean, who's in charge right now of this world? It's Hasitan. It's the enemy. It's the prince of darkness. It's the god of this world in low G. Okay? That's who's in charge right now. Now, we know who's ultimately in charge, right? We know who's sitting on the throne. But right now, there's someone else who has title over this land and all the land. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the enemy. In whom the God of this world, Logi, has, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of the Messiah, who is in the image of God, should, shrine, should shine unto them. I think my... Oh, I got Yeah. So who's the God of this world? It's the enemy, right? It's not the Father right now. Someone else has title over it, only because the Father gave it to him for a temporary time. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence thou comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Satan's all over the place. He's walking up and down the earth. Okay, he goes to and fro as well. Who is the enemy targeting the most in this world today? The children. It's the kids, overwhelmingly so. Who is he trying to have the most influence over today? It's the children. The kids, overwhelmingly so. Abortion in modern times. Abortions have always been performed throughout history, always. In fact, you can even read about it in the book of Enoch, twice. It's one of the reasons I think the enemy works so hard to get the book of Enoch taken out of Scripture because it's the only book that would have mentioned abortion actually twice. And right now you have churches, at least in my country, that support abortion and support people doing it. Well, it's because they don't have anything in their Bible speaking against it. Well, they used to. It was taken out. And it's been rediscovered about two or three hundred years ago. Abortions have always been performed throughout history, but it's only in the modern age that they have become so easily acquired and common. So they've always been performed. But it's now, during this time, in these last days, in the last 100 years, the last 50 years, they have become prevalent, so prevalent that even governments will pay for them. How many children have been lost to abortion? Who knows? We can't really know. It's, in fact, they, they, I've tried to look up the number. It's incalculable. They don't know. There's no way to keep track. Why? Why in this modern age is abortion so common? Could it be that the enemy is making this possible in these last days? Because he knows his end is near, and he knows where the end game comes from. It's the kids. Modern entertainment, the moving industry, television programming, video games, all geared towards kids, all filled with corruption, lies, sin, to deceive the children. The enemy doesn't know exactly when the end game is going to happen, just like we don't. But he's preparing. If I can corrupt as many kids as possible, I can disrupt the plans. Marvel Comics. You guys are familiar with this company? I've actually done work for this company um, before, um, I don't know, a few years back before I left to live off grid. I worked for an entertainment licensing company in the movie industry. I was a graphic designer, front end designer, and uh, built some, some things for Marvel Comics. And um, that was before I learned more about what these guys were doing and some of the background of these guys. It's crazy. I want you to meet this guy here. His name is Alan Moore. He's a nice looking fella, huh? 
This guy is one of the main writers for all of the comic book industries, not just Marvel, but other ones too. He's one of the main writers. And he worships the god Glycon. That's his god. He, so you guys sit down, you watch these programs that are mostly geared towards kids, teens, preteens, and younger. This is who you're putting into your home. That's him. He writes this stuff. This is one of his comic books. He writes one of his comics, God is Dead. The two people who are really the most responsible for the majority of superhero movies and comic book movies are two people who profess to be magicians. That's Alan Moore and Grant Morrison, those two people. And there's others. You can, you can do your own research. But very interesting, these are the people who are writing the scripts mostly for these movies. They're very secluded. Okay, They, they don't go out in public very much. Um, you know, People who are close to them acknowledge their open witchcraft that they do but they, they don't, they're not in the public eye. Marvel does not bring these guys out every time a movie gets released and says, oh, here's our writer. Because you know, they're not exactly public friendly. They don't look the part. You know, they're not, not some nice executive in a suit. Yeah, not photogenic. <laughs> but that's who's, writing, that's who's writing these movies. Do your own research on it. There's a, movie, uh, a great documentary out there called The Replacement Gods. Has anyone ever seen this? Yeah, a couple people. You guys need to watch this documentary. It's called The Replacement Gods. A lot of times you can find it free on YouTube. Okay? It's, it was put together by a Christian company, but it is excellent. Excellent. If you have children in your home, if you're watching these kinds of movies, this will open the doors and show you exactly what you're watching, what you're bringing into the home, and who's behind it. It's called The Replacement Gods. I highly recommend it. I've mentioned it many times on my channel. Please watch this movie. Modern entertainment, the movie industry, television programming, video games. It's all there. It's all geared towards kids. It's all there meant to deceive them, to, to draw them in and, and alter their worldview. You know, a worldview that is not compatible with Scripture and the commandments of our Creator. Disney. Sometimes this is very non unpopular, what I'm about to tell you. Yeah. There, Disney is, in my opinion, part of the problem. We have grown up watching, I grew up watching Disney, a lot of kids grew up watching Disney, but you would not believe the amount of subliminal influence in these movies. It's amazing. This right here, Lion King, is full. I'm gonna show you one image, and it's as most G as I can get, um, but there are even more that are even worse in the movie. But it's all subliminal imaging. In America, that's how they sell everything. That's how they sell their coffees, it's how they sell their sodas, it's how they sell everything, is subliminal imaging. And they've been doing this since the 1970s. Marketing companies are very familiar with these tactics. To draw the kids in, to draw the adults in. I'll show you another one, Tangled. Anybody remember this movie? S E S. And you have a woman tying up a man with her hair. Yeah, the triple six in the, in the name Disney. Yeah, so I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm not that big. I, I believe in conspiracy theories, and but I just think a lot of this stuff is, I mean, you can't not mistake putting that in. Someone put that in on purpose. Whether it was a designer going off course and just doing it on his own, what, whatever. But that just, does, listen, these companies have gigantic firms that make sure you know, what goes out to the public is approved first. Someone approved that, and I'm sorry, but you cannot not see that. It's very obvious. Movie industry, again, television programming, the pornography is rampant throughout all of these things. And I just showed you a couple of examples. You can do your own homework on this and all of the subliminal imaging that's going through the Disney movies. And not just Disney, it's all the childhood stuff. A lot of it. You, don't even, you won't even see it. But see, the kids are seeing it. And you have people like Hannah Montana you know, who is turning into my, you know, Miley Cyrus and how she turns out. It's just crazy. But she was, you know, one of Disney's front runners. And all of this subliminal imaging was sent to all these kids. It's just the enemy's attack on, on our children. And I know it's, it's, it weighs down on my heart because it's hard to raise kids these days and to keep them protected from all the influences that are trying to reach them. It, it's, it's tough as a parent. And sometimes you just want to give up and be like, uh, no, 
Be strong. Be strong, parents. We have never seen so many cases of childhood diseases these days, we are, as we are seeing right now. Never seen it. The examples are autism, asthma, and childhood diabetes. They're off the charts. Unbelievable. At least in America, they are. There's a big move in, in the Hebrew movement in America. We're trying to avoid you know, giving vaccines to our kids. I don't know what the rules are here. And what they're forced, but a lot of states, they're forced. If you want to go to public school in America, you have to get vaccines and be up to date on them. That's why so many parents are pulling their kids out of the schools and homeschooling because they don't want to get the vaccines. But right now, today, we can attribute this to, I believe, two things. Increased non-natural chemicals in our food, okay, the high processing of our food, which is one of the reasons we moved off grid so I could grow my own food and grow my own animals. I know what's in them because I grew it. And then vaccines. Right now today, one out of every 68 kids born in America will develop autism. One out of every 68. That is off the charts. That's like playing Russian roulette. 29 doses, which equals 115 anti-gen vaccines before age two. Before age two, you're giving your kid 115 shots, basically. Well, it's 29 shots. But included with that, 115 vaccines before they get to age two. That's a lot of chemicals. And we wonder why our kids are sick. Why is this happening right now? Why is the world pushing this on us? Now you see, maybe, why Egypt, or the Hebrews in Egypt, cried out to be released from bondage. We don't, we're in bondage. We don't even know it. Some of us don't even know it. You know, but the Father's waking his people up. And we're looking around and we're like, I can't raise my kids around this. I can't, raise, I can't live around this. You know one of the reasons I moved out in the middle of nowhere is because I can't handle the sin. I'm not, I'm not strong enough. I'm just not. It's, it's, I'm pummeled with it every day in the cities. And so you know what? i got to get my family away from this. I have to get away from this so that I don't falter. I don't fall because my family's relying on me. I'm the head of my household. And you see throughout Scripture, when the head of the household falls, the family falls. And sometimes they're punished for the same uh, punishment as, as the head. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to go down with the ship. You know, I'm not going to fail my family in that, in that manner. So I moved. It's hard because it pummels you all the time. All these things are affecting our children. Why would the adversary be attacking children so much and so often in order to corrupt them? And it's because he knows. He knows the end game. For such is the kingdom of God, Yeshua said. There you go. For such is the kingdom of God. The enemy knows. He knows, but he doesn't know how. He doesn't know when. But he's moving his chess pieces on the board. We know who's going to win the game. But, you know, he's got an idea of how it's going to be played. Conclusion. I believe the 144,000 are kids, roughly between the ages of 5 and 10. That's my estimate. Okay, young kids with extreme amounts of power. I believe they will receive a new song in a vision or be taken for a short time to the throne. I don't know how that's going to work. It just says they're given a new song. I believe it's going to be similar to the song of Moses. Okay, Because they are going to be the Moses for our generation. I believe that these kids will have an amazing power to perform miracles and extraordinary feats of violence to protect God's people in the wilderness. Just like we saw in the first exodus. Imagine the government coming to stop a mass multitude of people under a protection and covering of a pillar of fire. And those kids being able to overturn those forces with a move of their hand. Extraordinary amounts of power. I believe that there will be 144,000 camps, each starting off with a pillar of fire by day and smoke by night. Isaiah 4 verse 5 backs that up. I believe that these groups, 144,000, will merge with others and eventually be taken up or raptured up to watch with our Messiah the judgment that falls on the earth for one day, the day of atonement. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. That's where the Christian church gets the rapture theory. It's not a rapture you've gone away for seven years. No, it's one day. I just got to bring you out of this earth to watch the judgment below, just the same way he brought Noah in an ark above the earth, above the waters, while the waters performed the judgment. He lifted his people up. We're going to be lifted up, this time in the sky, not above the waters. First by water, second by fire. The Messiah will land with 144,000 on the Mount of Olives with us, the multitudes at the base, ready to hear and obey Shema, the Torah. So he brings us up, 
144,000 land with him on the Mount of Olives. And we're at the base, ready to hear it. Just like young David slew the giant, so will these young children slay the dragon in Revelation 12 that attempts to make war with the woman in the wilderness. Just like Pharaoh. <clears throat> That's my horse in the race. That's my horse in the race. All right, we're going to go ahead and go quickly into Joel 2 army. Uh, Part 3. We're just going to keep on going down the line. Oh, look, there's my family again. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start off with a quick review of what we just talked about and what we talked about yesterday. Throw some stuff in there. There will be, there will be a greater exodus. Scripture is clear, okay? So we know that, you know, there's two houses. The one to the north went out to be dispersed, or I'm sorry, scattered amongst, outcast amongst the nations, okay, to be as the goyim. They forgot who they were, lost their identity. That's why we're here this weekend, talking about the identity so they lost it. You know, Judah, he maintained the scepter, the lawgiver from between his feet. He held on to the Torah. He guarded it. And so we're going to be brought back. That northern kingdom gets brought back. They regain their identity. They come back. They regain their inheritance. I believe it's going to be children to lead it. All of that. When the greater exodus happens and we're moved out from our places where we live right now today, we have to understand these are not our homes. This is only temporary. Where we're going is the kingdom in Jerusalem to be ruled by our, by our Messiah, by the true king of the root of Jesse, the root of David. The children will be in one accord. They will all have one heart. Okay, There won't be any bickering amongst them. They know what the, what the rules are. They're going to set us straight. Everyone asks, you know, what calendar? How are we going to fix our calendars? Everyone's on different calendars. How are we going to fix this? The first thing they did when they got out of Egypt is they set the calendar. Exodus chapter 12. Okay, we're out. Here's how we start the month, guys. Really simple. There won't be any more fighting about that. I know every year people are like, oh, Zach, I wish we could just all get on the same page. I wish we could too. But we all have different opinions on what that is. You know, and so just one of the things I, I do, you can't fight about these things. And as you guys are going into your fellowships, don't fight about this stuff. And if you feel that it's better to fellowship with people who keep the calendar, that's fine. But then don't lament or chastise anyone for keeping a different calendar. They're your brothers and sisters, and when the exodus happens, they're going to be with you, okay? And then the calendar will be set, and you'll all be on the same page, and it'll be great. The children will be in one accord. Yes, they will yield massive amounts of power, just like Moses did, just like Aaron did, okay? They're going to have massive amounts. They're going to be there to protect you. They're going to be there to protect God's people, whether they're children or not, or whether I'm right or not, there's going to be someone there to protect us. I believe it's going to be these kids. 144. So imagine someone that came up and asked me during the break, well, you know, is this the adults? Or, I mean, is this the Church of Philadelphia? And how, are we being raptured up in Thessalonians? It doesn't say kids there in Thessalonians. No, everyone gets raptured up. The kids, everyone, the whole group gets raptured up for one day to see the judgment, and then they're set down on the Mount of Olives for the Feast of Tabernacles during that time, okay? We're all going to be astronauts for a day. <laughs> Just like Noah was raised up above the waters, we'll be raised up above the atmosphere to watch the judgment. The waters were below. The judgment was below for the waters. The judgment will be fire below for us, okay? And we'll be raised up above it. That's what Christianity calls the rapture. It's not really a rapture. 144,000 groups of people that begin to merge. So we're all merging all these groups, we're moving. Some are bigger, some are smaller, but we're actively moving around the earth where the Father places us. We're not in charge. We're not going where we want to go. We're following the pillar of fire just like in the first Exodus. Okay? We have to have faith and trust in Him that He will lead us. Wherever He leads, we'll go, right? How about a nice game of chess? Have you ever seen that movie War Games? Yeah. The way you win at chess is to think two or three moves ahead of your opponent. That's how you win at chess. Anybody play chess? Hey, most people know how to play, right? It teaches basic strategy. Strategy, you know, my kids, you know, my, already my five-year-old is learning how to play chess. It, it's basic strategy. You want to teach your kids strategic, how to think strategically in life? Chess is a great way to start. You think two or three moves ahead. Would, likewise, wouldn't the, wouldn't the enemy also be trying to think two or three moves ahead? Wouldn't he also be strategizing if he knows the game plan? 
at least part of the game plan. More evidence of the 144,000 being children. And I was talking about this this morning with some of my hosts. Um, children are a fruit of the womb, okay? The, fruit, the first fruits of the womb can be redeemed by God. First fruits. Verses Exodus 13, um, 15, Exodus 34, 19, Numbers 3, 12, and Numbers 18, 15. Back that up. We talked about that in the last segment. Okay, so there's precedent for this. First fruits. Everything that opens the matrix in all flesh, according to Scripture, which they bring unto the Lord, whether it be of men or beasts, shall be thine. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man shall thou surely redeem, and the firstling of an unclean beast shall thou redeem. And then it gives the instructions on how to do that. But that's Numbers 18.15. Everything that opens the matrix. What is the matrix? It's not as obvious of an answer as you might think. Hebrew, the Hebrew word is rechem, rechem. It means womb 21 times, it's used, and then matrix, it's used five times in the King James. I'm just using the King James English. Matrix and womb, 21 times, basically 26 times total. Clearly from Scripture, we have something that is being opened and closed, opened and closed. The rechem, in my opinion, is the cervix of a woman. Any doctor will tell you that the cervix opens and it closes. It opens and it closes. It's a doorway to the womb of a woman. The business of being born. Has anybody ever seen this movie? <clears throat> a few of you, good. Has any, you know who Rachel Ray is, the cook? She's a cook, right? I see a lot of nodding heads, good. Rachel Ray, she um, was a cook for a number of years, had her own TV show, very popular. My wife loves her cooking shows. And she learned a lot of her cooking skills from watching that show. She loves it. And um, eventually she got to the point where she wanted to have children. And so she stopped doing this for a while and began having children. And she was surprised at how the industry is geared towards C-sections in America. Almost all children born in the hospital today in America are, are all C-section. You can't find a natural birth. In fact, the whole bit point of this movie, the business of being born, they interview a number of nurses, and the nurses say, they ask the nurses, how often do you see a natural birth in your hospital? And they said, almost never. And this is a hospital for birthing children, and they see almost never a natural birth. Why is that in the last number of years, the last couple of decades, have it's all, it's all gone to a C-sections? And I talked to some people here, it's pretty much that way in South Africa too, correct? It's the same way in Europe. It's the same way in parts of uh, Mexico and Central America and Canada. It's that way in a lot of places. In fact, there's not a lot of Western first world countries where you can go and have natural childbirth if you go to a hospital, unless you're just lucky and you have a good doctor who leads you that way. So a lot of people, a lot of Hebrews in America today are choosing natural childbirth at home, and they're having great success. And some may say, well, if you've had a C-section, you can't have a natural childbirth. That's not true. It's called, in America, it's called a VBAC, vaginal birth after cesarean, VBAC. And they're doing it with great success, amazing success. But we've been told that you can't do it. Why were we told you can't do it when these people are doing it? Why is this system built that way? Both of my children were cesarean. Okay, they weren't natural because the doctor led us that way. Even the second one was going to try to do a VBAC. The doctor was going to do that. And at the very last minute, oh, I gotta get home for dinner. Let's do the C-section, you know. And so he pushed us that way, but you know, it was, they they try to scare you into doing it. It's weird. How, it's it's crazy. So many of the nations are now moving towards C-sections instead of natural birth. Why? What is that? What does that do with these verses that make it clear the value of coming through the matrix? It's the firstborn, the first fruits that they can be redeemed. Those that are born through the matrix. The Rechem. <clears throat> so, before I move on, I just, I just want to throw that out there because I think it's important in these last days. I think it's more evidence that these are children and they're being targeted by the enemy. Because if I can disqualify a child because he was not born out of the matrix, you know, I'm going to make that move as the enemy when you're playing chess. You know, and again, both of my kids were cesarean. They were not natural birth. But a lot of Hebrews today, as we're growing as a people, we're learning scripture, we're always learning, they're choosing to do natural childbirth. 
In fact, there's a number of midwives in my area that are performing this and they're always busy because we're producing and we're producing fast. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> okay. Well, will the greater Exodus be like, let me go back. I think, we have proved, I think we've proven through Scripture that there will be a second Exodus that was much greater than the first. I don't believe in the rapture the way the Christian church te teaches it. What will the greater Exodus be like? Answer, we can only guess based on the first of what a second Exodus might look like. So we want to look at a second Exodus. What did the first look like? Remember that always. When you're trying to you know, test this in your mind, you're going home and you're studying in your Scriptures and you have a question. You know, I wonder what will happen you know, for this scenario. We you know, like someone asked me the other day about tents. Are we going to have to bring tents? Should I bring a camper? Well, what did they do the first time? They, they took their belongings. It says the kind of belongings they brought. I think by the time they got to Sukkot, which was their first stop, they started building tents. And that's why it was named Sukkot, the booths, tents. It was forever named. It wasn't named Sukkot before they got there. It was, Scripture is pretty clear that it was named Sukkot after they got there and then forevermore because it was known as the place where about three to five million people started building tents because they realized we need some kind of shelter here. If you want to know the things of the second, look towards the first. All right, things to explore. Moving across the earth in a greater exodus. So here's what we're going to talk about today. I believe the 144,000 will make up the new Levites and priests in the coming kingdom. Okay, who's going to be the Levites? I believe 144,000 taken out of each of these tribes because we don't know who the Levites, the true Levites are today. We have an idea based on the sons of Aaron and, and some DNA and things like that that's very helpful. But I think the Father is going to choose for himself Levites. I think it's very clear in the book of Isaiah and um, uh, 66 and Zechariah that we are going to be choosing Levites. He's going to be, he's going to be choosing Levites. Um, we're going to talk about the Joel 2 army. You know, what is, the, what is the army? I've heard all kinds of speculation on the Joel 2 army. We'll talk about that. How long will we be in the wilderness? How long are we going to be there? Is it going to be 40 years? I hope not. Really? I don't want to be 40 years. I don't think it's going to be 40 years, guys. What are some of the things we know about the first exodus? Well, we know one. Number one, Pharaoh died along with a bunch of the Egyptians trying to keep Israel from leaving their control. We know that. So we can maybe expect others to maybe keep us from leaving their control. They had numerous battles along the way before they entered the land. They fought. Okay, It's not just spiritual warfare and prayer warfare. There was actually hand-to-hand -hand combat that took place as they encountered some of the people. You know, when the, when the Father granted them favor, they won, and they won most of the time. They fought additional battles after entering the land. They had to cleanse the land. I don't think we're going to have to do that part. I think the Father's going to do that with the fire that comes down and burns up the sin that's in the land. We're going to have to rebuild but I don't think we're going to have to do battle after we enter the land. Not this time. I know sometimes it's hard to think that the actual fighting will be the part of the Messiah's return. Because some of us aren't just geared that way, okay? But some of us are geared that way. And some of us are not going to shy from that sort of battle. But understand that the Father gives us favor, right? We have allowed modern Christianity and the security of at least my American lifestyle to make us forget that hardships can be a part of life. You know, Americans live a very comfortable life. You know, we don't think about some of the hardships. I don't know what it's like for all of you, but sometimes I think we forget how, how good we have it. War is horrible, but it's not as bad as when God, when God is on your side. We even have an example of a battle in the Bible where not a man was lost. I believe in that battle, which was a pretty gruesome battle from descriptions of Scripture, that probably men were killed in that battle and were healed instantly. The, sword had, the, the blow of the sword had no effect on man because they had God's favor. So here's some examples. I have Genesis 14, 1 through 20. The outcome was a win. Abraham gave tithe to the Melchizedek, and Melchizedek attributes victory to God. It was an amazing battle there. And then Genesis 34, the men of Shechem, uh, they won that battle, and uh, it was God's involvement wasn't really there because it was, a, it was a retaliation for the raping of their sister. Exodus 17, 8 through 15, the Amalekites, they won that battle. While Moses' arms were raised, Israel won. So these are all battles before the Exodus, or after, during, before and during the Exodus. And then you have Numbers 14, 39 through 45, the Amalekites, they lost. They tried to go to battle after the Father. They, they lost their chance to go into the land because of their, their, their lack of faith. They said, oh, well, okay, we'll do it, we'll do it. And then this is like God said, no, you already lost that opportunity. And they lost. And you have Numbers 21, 1 through 3, the Canaanites. 
They won that battle. The Lord listened to Israel's request, and the Canaanites were defeated. And Israel completely destroyed them and their cities. Notice that the last battle before the Torah is given at Sinai is the battle of Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17. That's important, and we're going to tell you why in a moment. Then you have the covenant being ratified with the blood on the bodies of the people. So it says, Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. Exodus 24, verse 8. Now, one year later, one year later, you have this. Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month in the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of, children, of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with the number of their names, every male by their poles. Verse 3, from 20 years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. And then you have Numbers 10, 11. And it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year, again, second year, that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony. Chapter 10 is full of military drills. Does anybody recognize the Torah commandment here? One year. What, what are you not allowed to do for the first year after marriage? You go to war. He sprinkled the blood on the people. Now, without getting graphic, where is the blood after the, the consummation of marriage? Who's the bride? The people. He sprinkled the blood. That's the marriage. That's the covenant. It's the contract. I am married unto you, he says. I'm not going to war for a year. My time is to be with you. It was a very tumultuous first year of marriage. He killed a lot of his bride who was disobedient. But there's a year of marriage there. After a year of marriage, it's time to go to work. It's time to go to war. We got to get somewhere. We got to start counting our people. We got to get our armies together. We got to start training. We got to start the trumpets. Every, I mean, in America, you watch the old cavalry movies. They had a trumpet call for everything, a, a, a trumpet call to eat, a trumpet call to charge, a trumpet call to retreat. Everything was done by the trumpet. Where do you think they got that from? Ta -da! Your Bible. That's been the way of militaries and armies for centuries, millennia. Trumpets. If you have a, a, a platoon or a company of soldiers way over on that hillside and you want to tell them to move forward, you use a trumpet to tell them to move forward. And so what is Numbers chapter 10 full of? The beginning of the chapter is, hey, we're going to learn trumpet calls. We're going to start learning trumpets. They're training their army because they're getting ready to go to war. The intention was to be in the wilderness, in my opinion, one year. In the military, it used to have, a do they used to have dozens of bugle calls that every soldier had to memorize. You had to memorize these. It was part of basic training. You know, Even in the military today, when I was in the infantry, uh, we had certain military bugle calls that would play over loudspeakers. So to let you know when to stand to attention because somewhere on post, the American flag was being raised up the flagpole. And then at the end of the day, the, the American flag was taken down from the flagpole and they sound the same bugle call and everyone stood at attention and stopped what they were doing. People who were driving on cars on the base would have to stop their cars, get out of their cars, and stand at attention if they were a soldier until the, the bugle play was finished. Even today, we're still doing this. I don't know what the military here does today, but that's what we did. There's calls for officers, calls for retreat, advance, flanking. Oh, okay. <laughs> How many of you believe that a marriage or covenant took place at Sinai? It's absolutely true. I am married unto you, he says. Here are some verses that back that up. Jeremiah 3.8, and I saw when there were all causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery. To commit adultery, you have to be married. I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. To give a bill of divorce, you have to be married. Turn, O backsliding, backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married unto you. He says it. I'm married unto you. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which I my covenant, they broke, although I was a husband unto them. Lots of marriage talk. So I think it's pretty clear that God considers his people his bride. So if that's the case, what does it mean for any future battles of the greater exodus? 
Keep in mind that the question for the prophets that was discussed by Paul was how was God going to take back an adulterous bride who was given a bill of divorce? The short answer is that the son being the symbol and the flesh of the father died and was raised again, being the bride, we are born again. That's the whole conversation with Nicodemus, having died in our sins. So you have new groom, new bride can come back together. The greater exodus. You have a new groom, you have a new bride. He's coming. He's not going to be there during the greater exodus. He comes on Yom Kippur. And we celebrate, we consummate the marriage with the feast of the lamb, the feast of tabernacles, the marriage supper of the lamb. There's a big feast. It's the wedding feast. We were all taught in Christianity. Don't think Christianity has it all wrong, because they don't. They've got a lot of stuff right. You know, and, it's, and some of it's very good. We just have to test some of this stuff with Scripture. They were right to teach us about the marriage supper of the Lamb, because that's what it's going to be. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of all the people, and they said, all that the Lord has says, we will do and be obedient. See, that's the verse right before the blood. I do. What do you do when you stand at the altar? Do you take such and such, you know? I do. The people said, I do. And then Moses took the blood. It's the ratifying of the covenant. It's the consummation of the marriage on the bride. I mean, do you see the, 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 the links here, right? I believe that all of this took place on the Feast of Shavuot. Feast of Shavuot. I mean, it doesn't say, but based on the time frame it gives, it's either very close or on the Feast of Shavuot. So at the consummation of the marriage, the blood took place in Exodus 24. The clock should start ticking at that point. One year. I get you for one year. Tick tock. One year comes up. We're at Numbers chapter 10. It's ready to go. Time to start training for war. Time to go to boot camp. We're going to go into the land. So where did they go? Want to guess? They begin to spy out the land. It's the first thing they do. Send the spies. You're in the army now, right? <laughs> And we know how that ended up. It didn't work out well. But Numbers 10, the verse 11, time frame is very close to Shavuot. The Torah doesn't really give us the dates of the next Shavuot, but we know from verse 11 that it's close. It's in the second year, second month, right? Very close. A full year goes by from the blood covenant of them moving and getting directions for war. So one year later, let's go ahead and go over that commandment. It says, when a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business. But he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he has taken. And it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony. So um, you guys know Steve Mutria. You guys heard of him? A Torah family online. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, we do share a lot of uh, interest. And we disagree on some things. And we agree on a lot of things. And so I highly recommend he has a, a, a reading and teaching called Cut Short on his website. If you're interested, I highly recommend it. Cut short. So a lot of people are speculating through Christianity, we're going to, you know, the tribulation is going to be seven years or three and a half years, depending on what time frame you come. I'm going to suggest, you know, maybe it's one year. It's just one year because that's the term of a marriage. That's when you can go to war. I think that was the original intent. It's obvious that was the original intent from the first exodus. They were in there one year, and then on Numbers chapter 10, they're getting ready for war. We always hear that the Hebrews were in the wilderness for 40 years. But that's not true. Actually, it was 41 years. Because they had the one year up to Numbers chapter 10, then they mess up their whole spy mission, and now they're an additional 40 years. It's actually it's 41. 40 plus 1. The father's original intention was one year with his bride. One year. It was a tumultuous first year of marriage. The Hebrews were constantly complaining and being punished for it. Note, do not complain. Nobody likes a, nobody likes a complainer, even God. 3,000 people died at the hands of the Levites, it says. It's also interesting to note that Levites wore the sword. We'll talk more about that later. It was only after the people brought back a bad report that God told them they would now wander in the wilderness for 40 years. They had already been in the wilderness for a, four, for a year at that point. So 40 plus 1 is 41. Let's look at some of the prophetic battles in Scripture. Psalms chapter 2. <clears throat> this is really interesting. 
Why do the heathen rage and why the pe- and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set, it means Yasab, themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Verse 8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they that put their trust in him. Now, call me crazy, but I don't think Psalms 2 has happened yet. It's describing a battle. It's describing those who rise up against, number one, his anointed and him. When the, ki- when the greater exodus happens, all the kings of the earth will have an opinion about it. Trust me. Every government, every politician, every bureaucrat is going to have an opinion on what's going on and what they should do about it. It doesn't matter. He who sits in the heavens will laugh because it's not up to them. (laughs) He will have his way. Just like Pharaoh, the kings of the earth will mount an attack against the woman brought into the wilderness. But just like the first exodus, the father will protect his people, the bride for his son. It's his son's bride. We know that the plagues of Egypt and the revelations are very similar. We talked about this already. There's lots of charts, all kinds of charts. You can go online on Google, and you can search for Revelation, Exodus, plagues, and you'll find all kinds of charts just like this one that come up, which compare all the different plagues together and show how similar they are. It's amazing when I started looking into that. I was like, this, this can't be a coincidence. People have long speculated why these plagues are very similar. It's because the events in Revelation are mirroring the Exodus of Egypt. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that shall no more be said, the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of the north and from all the islands where I have driven them, and I will bring them again into their land which I gave unto their fathers. He's bringing them back, and they're not going to talk about the old one. It's going to be so much bigger. Isaiah 11, 11, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time, the second time, to recover the remnant of his people. So we clearly seem to have a repeat. I mean, it's obvious, right? It's going to happen again. Something's happening a second time. What? We don't know this for sure, but it sure looks like it's going to be the exodus. We can never fully be sure until it happens. All we can do is study. So let's keep going. Revelation 12, 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Revelation 12, 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. So he's going to bring his people into the wilderness. And what did he do? He nourished them. He gave them food. He allowed their clothes not to wear out, their shoes not to wear out. And he gave him commandments, instructions for life. If that's not nourishment, I don't know what is. That's the, we may not think it's nourishment with the, with the nice lifestyles that many of us live, but that's true nourishment. That's true nourishment that we need. I think most of you are all seeking that out because that's why you're here. Exodus 19.4. Yea, we have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Very similar to Revelation. Now compare all that with these verses in Hosea. Check this out. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. Very similar. Nourishment along with comfort. And I will give her her vineyards from thence in the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Same thing. As she came up from the lands of Egypt. Just like that. Hosea 2.19 And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. See, folks, this is how you talk to your bride. You comfort her, and you, 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 you tend to her in loving kindness 
And you have this betrothing that happens. This is marriage talk again. Well, if we're getting married, that means we have some other things we might have to look forward to. A year with our, our groom, and then there might be a war coming after that. Well, we not. I don't believe we're fighting this war at the end of the year. I believe it's going to be him that fights that war. It's going to be his fire that rains down, not ours. Okay. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. Remember, we didn't deserve mercy. We, we were outcast because of our disobedience, right? But he's going to have mercy. And I will say to them, which were not my people, because of our disobedience, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. The people which were not his people because of our disobedience are now his people because we sought after it again. Please keep something in mind when the, with the prophets. Remember, I told you about this yesterday. It's when you read them, the major prophets, Jeremiah and Isaiah especially, you read it through. This is going to make so much more sense when you read it. Doom and gloom and then hope. Doom and gloom and then hope. People are like, what is that? It's like bad and then good, bad and then good. Yeah, because he's giving you a time of hope, of time of restoration that he's going to bring us back to the, to the promises and the inheritance that he gave our, our forefathers, our true forefathers. So now that we're in the wilderness, one year, what happens next? What happens the first time? What I speculate, my horse in the race, again, Kentucky Derby, Churchill Downs, we leave for the wilderness one Passover. Maybe it means people speculate, is it going to be Passover? Is it going to be Sukkot? Well, what happened the first time? It was Passover. So I speculate it will be like that again. We'll leave for the wilderness one Passover. We fight off attacks from the dragon along the way. There's some fighting involved. Whether it be totally the power of God or whether we're active participants, I do not know. But we'll have to see. Either way, we win. Shavuot to Shavuot, we're in the wilderness for one year. So we leave Passover, and we get to a point, and there's a certain point where there's a year, and we're anointed with the blood of the covenant again, and then it's one year in the wilderness. We begin to move across the face of the earth, Joel 2. That's where we're going to go next, Joel 2. So Joel 2, spe Joel 2 speculation. There's a guy named Rory Lindsay out there. Anybody ever hear Rory Lindsay? He has a website called 10losttribes.com, amazing website. And uh, he has a lot of teachings on how he sees the movement of God's people across the earth in the tribulation. He also believes very much in a greater exodus. Uh, but he has some really good spec. Some of it I agree, some I don't. But it's just really good food for thought. And uh, we're always trying to learn more about Scripture. And so he presents a really good perspective on this. And he has it very clearly this time as we enter the land, we're coming into the land, and we're going to get close to the land before the judgment. We're going to be coming in from the north. He shows scripture after scripture after scripture of God's people coming in this time. Remember last time we came in from the east over the Jordan, right? But this time, according to scripture, it looks very clear we're coming in from the north. He has a lot of evidence for this on his website. So if you're interested, check it out. All I want to show are the similarities of the first exodus with the Joel 2 army. I was amazed when I, when I looked at this. You can decide if it's the same thing or not. It's up to you. So let's start with Numbers, chapter 22, verse 1 through 2. Amazing similarities. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And you have Numbers, chapter 22, verse 3, next verse. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. You have all these people coming towards your nation you're distressed. You're talking, I mean, every time that a country enters war, or there's a major earthquake or something, what do all the nations around it struggle with? The refugees. Because they're seeking help, and they're going to where, the, where they think the help might be. And they stress about it. Numbers 22.4, And Moab sent unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company... Lick up all that are round about us as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at this time. And then next verse. He sent messengers, therefore, to Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there's this people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the whole earth, and they abide over against me. Now, let's check out Joel chapter 2, verse 2, and compare. Before I begin, a lot of people speculate, and you may have heard some of these speculations on what the Joel 2 army is. Some people say that this is a Christian army, at least where I come from. 
They're big on that. This is a giant army of Christians who are taking over the whole earth for Jesus. And in America, there's a large amount of denominations that are going towards this route. We have to conquer the media for Jesus. We have to conquer the schools for Jesus. We have to conquer uh, the medical industry for Jesus. We have to conquer everything, the politics, the country, politically for Jesus. We have to conquer everything for Jesus. And then, once we've done that, Jesus will return. Yeah, kingdom now, exactly. That's, that's uh, Rick Joyner and some other big names in Christianity are, are for this. I don't agree with that. Then you have others who are like, have more of a sci-fi view of this, where it's aliens coming down from Earth, that's the Joel 2 army, and that they're evil, and that they're some kind of Nephilim, or, you know, I, and I'm a, big, I'm a big believer in Nephilim returning in the last days. I think that genetically, they're working on that stuff right now. They're already mixing pig and animal chimeras, and it's nasty. I mean, they're doing that. We know that for a fact. But I don't think this is that, okay? I believe in the Nephilim, but this is not that. I believe it's the greater Exodus. I believe it's going to be us. It's going to be us that does this. I'm going to show you the similarities. So Joel 2, we just read numbers. Joel 2, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread on the mountains. A great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A great people has ne like never been seen before. If it's, I mean, three to five million people is a lot of people, but this is going to be bigger. And it's coming from all over the earth. Wouldn't this not be like a people that has never been seen before? I think so. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burneth, and the land that is the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. That's just like the verses in Numbers. Balaam says, Look, our Balak says, look at these people. They're devouring everything. Everything in their path is being ruined. And they're now on my border. Same thing. They're moving over this and everything is being destroyed. I, made, I make mention of a concert. You ever go to an outdoor concert where they have nice grass and lawns? Um, Woodstock in America is a very popular one. They have other ones too. Where you put about... I don't know, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000 people on grass, on nice fields for a big rock concert. You ever see what it looks like when they all leave? It's destroyed. It takes a year to, to rebuild that all up for the next concert. It's only one a year. Once a year they do it because they got to rebuild it every, every year. It completely destroys it. What's it going to look like when you have millions of people passing over the earth? They'll consume everything. Let's go back to Numbers chapter 22. Start at verse 9. For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him, and lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. It's like, you can't compare this. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion, and lift up himself. This is the blessings. This is the blessings. And he'll lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain. Let's go to Joel chapter 1, verse 6. For a and compare. For a nation is come up, up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the cheek teeth of a great lion. He has laid my vine to waste, my bark, my fig tree, and has made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Back to Numbers chapter 22, verse 23. And Sihon would not suffer Israel to pass through his border, but Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel into the wilderness, and he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and possessed his land from Arnon unto the Jabbok, even unto the children of Ammon, for the border of the children of Ammon was strong. In 2521, And Israel took all these cities, and Israel dwelt in all the cities of the Amorites, in Heshbon, and all the villages thereof. They're passing through. They annihilated all these people and all their cities and took possession of them as they moved by. Took their spoils. Now let's go to Joel 2.8. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall, walk every, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. That's good. We've seen that before in Scripture. I don't like getting wounded by the sword. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. They're not saying he's a thief, okay? They're saying that entering the windows like a thief. Again, I'm not saying the Joel 2 army is the greater exodus. 
I'm just saying that they have similarities that can be studied more. Now if I, oh, I don't want to. Oh, it's right there. One second. I believe, let me just give me a second, because this was not part of my presentation, but um, Antoinette mentioned an amazing verse yesterday. It was Joel 2 something, wasn't it? Remember that verse, Antoinette? Yeah. <laughs> ah, here it is. I found it. Joel 2, verse 11. And the Lord shall utter. See, people have different opinions on whether this army is good or bad. And some people will say it's bad. It's the, it's, it's the army of the enemy coming against God's people and their Nephilim and all this stuff and their aliens. But this disproves that. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. It's his army. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executes his word. Not only is this army great, it is it his, but they're executing his word. That's what makes them strong. You see, when we are obedient to the commandments, we're given life, we're giving strength. And see, these are people who execute his word. This is a good army. I believe it's our army. We're going to be in the army. I believe we're going to take over the world that way. And anybody who stands in our path is going to be completely devoured. They can either join or die. <laughs> I really believe that. They can join just like the first time. You know, but they're going to have to obey. They're going to have to know the house rules and follow them. Anyone can be grafted in. That's the good news of the gospel. Always has been. Remember, the greater Exodus will be bigger than the first. Jeremiah 16 and Jeremiah 23. Those are two key verses I always give. Remember those. Have you ever seen some of the outside concerts? You know, again, after people leave, it's completely destroyed afterwards. A day of darkness and a gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong, there has never been ever, never been the like. Neither shall any, shall there be any more after, even to the years of many generations. There's, there's never been a group like this, and there never will be again, it says. What is it? It's us. The Levites and the priests. So here's my real quick uh, thoughts on the Levites and the priests. 144,000. Then we're going to wrap it up. <clears throat> the first fruits. Their first fruits. What are Levites? Their first fruits. People who have the, the positions are first fruits. Numbers 3.12 and Revelation 14.4 are for reference. I believe there's going to be a purging. Who does the purging? Who did the purging the first time? It was the Levites who grabbed the sword and did, went through the crowd and did the purging. That's their job, the 144,000. There's going to be a purging. They wear the sword. Mark 10, 21, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Ezekiel 20, 38, And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Levites and priests. Again, it's first fruits, Numbers 3, 12. A purging. These, these are the ones who do the purging. Let's go to Exodus 32, verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go out in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp and slay, or purge, every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. Whose job did that fall on? That was their job. The Levites. So Levites and priests, 144,000. That's my opinion on that. I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, says the Lord. This is Isaiah 66, 21, amazing verse. Where is he getting them from? If you read it in context, he's getting them from amongst the Gentiles who come out from the Gentiles. See, these are not Gentiles. They're coming out from among the Gentiles, Isaiah 66. This is the greater exodus. Isaiah 56, 6 through 8 also lends credence to this. Ezekiel 43, 18 is also part of that. There will be sacrifices in the coming kingdom, by the way. <clears throat> Those are also given there. Let me just say that um, Romans 13 is often used in my country as a way to give power to politicians and authority figures. And so it's often misrepresented in the Bible as a way to give honor to politicians. It's not. 
Okay, That's not what Paul was writing in Romans 13. There's only one who is the minister of God. That's the Levite. Okay, There's only one who is worth tribute because why? Why is he worth tribute? Why is, he worthy? Why is the Levite worthy of tribute? Huh? Appointed by God. But what, what does he not get that everyone else gets? Inheritance. He doesn't get an inheritance. So it's up to the body to support our brother Levi. He gets our tribute. You know, when we bring his, we bring our offerings to the temple. There's those sacrifices. Those, you ever notice the verses in your Torah about the skins? He can use those. They're, they're money. They were money back then. He could use those to support his family. So it's our tribute. He's worthy of tribute. Romans 13 talks about the one worthy of tribute. The one who wears the sword. You, talk, you look at uh, Rico Cortez has some amazing teachings on the temple, in, in the temple and, and, and the protocols for the temple. It was the Levite who wore the sword. It was the Levite's job for anyone who was not clean, who was not approaching the tabernacle in the proper protocol to strike him down with a sword. And Romans 13 talks about the one with the sword. It's the one who is the minister of God, it is the one worthy of tribute because he has no inheritance and he is the one that wears the sword. It's the Levite that's being discussed in Romans 13. Okay, It's not your excuse to give any power to an authority figure or uh, a politician or a bureaucrat or a law enforcement. That's always been the Levite. We, you know, you ever wonder why that never talks about the police in the Bible? Who is our law enforcement? I mean, everyone has to have law enforcement. I mean, what happens if someone breaks the law? Who do you go to? It's the Levite. They're the sheriff. They're in every town, every town. And you find different verses of them being in Cyrene and in Rome and you know, different Levites who come from different places to come do the feast in Jerusalem. Because they're everywhere. Everywhere God's people would be, the Levites would be also. All right. Let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you again for this day. We thank you so much for the rain. We ask it to continue. We ask it to continue to bring the rain upon this land as your, as your people seek uh, for things to grow and to be to be taken out of this restriction of water that they have right now. And Father, we just know that you continue to bring the rain and, and water your people and give hope to your people and have it be a sign for your people that you haven't forgotten about them, those who have come together here to seek your favor. Father, bless this conference, bless the speakers who are here, the words that would be spoken that would be of you, and that um, it would be all be for your glory, not for ours. Bless these people as they go, go home today and as they travel and Give them safe travel and passage. Allow them to continue to grow and to seek out others who are seeking to know your word and for them to network and, and to just, just, uh, just grow as a people and be comforted and be energized and be hopeful that there is a day coming where we're all going home. And it's because of a promise you made to Jacob. We ask all of this upon this conference and we ask it all in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen.